Let's pray together one more time. Lord, thank you for thank you for your sacrifice on the cross that has purchased us. And so because of that purchase and because you've given us your spirit, we can have ears to hear. Ears to hear when you encourage us and ears to hear when you exhort us. And both are in this text. And so help us have ears to hear, Lord. Help us have eyes to see Christ and be shaped more and more into his image, Lord. And even uh, for those who don't yet know you, Lord, Give them ears and eyes today for the first time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we look at all these letters, uh, if you haven't been with us, we've been in Revelation, and this picture of Jesus with a a sword out of his mouth probably isn't the picture that you're used to of Jesus, but that comes from Revelation chapter 1. So I'd encourage you right now during the introduction, if you're like, what's a sword come out of his mouth, go Read those ten verses, it's okay while I'm talking, that might be more helpful than my introduction. Just to get a picture of what we're looking at here, because all of these images of Jesus that start these letters come from some part of the Jesus we saw in Revelation 1. Remember, we said this book is written, and these letters were written to these real churches in Asia Minor with a lasting message for all churches, so that believers could endure in the name of Jesus through tribulation for the sake of the kingdom. Remember, endurance in the name of Jesus through tribulation for the sake of the kingdom. That's that threefold chord that we're going to keep seeing, the themes repeated. Temptation and trial were everywhere in Asia Minor. Weariness and worry were everywhere in Asia Minor. Pain and persecution were everywhere in Asia Minor. And what did these ch- churches need to know first? Well, they needed to see what we said in the beginning, Revelation 1, that Jesus was present, that Jesus was aware, that Jesus was the Savior who died to free them from their sins by his blood, that he was standing among the lampstands as that kind of Savior, and that he was a powerful and awesome king, sovereign, seeing all, holy, a mighty warrior with a piercing word. In other words, these letters and this endurance don't make sense unless meeting the risen Christ must change everything. In other words, you can't meet him and stay the same. You can't meet him and pretend like you didn't meet him. These letters and this endurance in this world that we're talking about, they can't make sense unless Jesus must change everything. In other words, those saved by Jesus must savor Jesus. Those freed by Jesus must follow Jesus. Those trusting Jesus must treasure Jesus. Those with faith in Jesus must remain faithful to Jesus. Now let's be really clear. This isn't talking about some kind of salvation by works. It's talking about the reality that genuine faith must treasure Jesus above all, be oriented on Jesus as Savior and King, and therefore know that to endure tribulation, whether trial or temptation, for the sake of his kingdom is worth it, because Jesus is real. When he saves you, when you meet him, when you receive the Holy Spirit, he becomes the most real thing in your life so that you can't avoid him. You can't turn him off. You can't compartmentalize him. He invades every space and every place that you are. His salvation is real. Praise God. His salvation is real. Do you know that his salvation is real this morning? That if you've trusted in Jesus Your sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. His salvation is real. And his sword is real. His presence is real because he's real. And it's either a treasure or a terror. Jesus is real. And if he's real and he's here and he's everywhere his churches and his people are, how should that change wherever we are and whatever we do? If he's here right now, if he's on the car ride home, 
If he's in your workplace, if he's at your school with you, how should that change? If he's in that room where you're tempted to click on that thing, how, how should that change who we are and what we're all about? And so today what we're going to see is that Jesus loves his church and his people far too much to settle for half-hearted worship in individuals or in his churches. He just loves us too much. He's not going to let us settle for half-hearted worship. So point number one is this recognition of faithfulness. So we're going to start with the good stuff. Look at verse 13, this commendation to this church. What were they doing well? Here's what verse 13 says. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So if we ask the question, what was Pergamum like? We start out with a kind of startling fact from Jesus here. Jesus says it is where Satan's throne is, where Satan dwells. And in this place, faithful witnesses are being put to death for their faith. So you ask the question, why is it referred to this way? Well, in Pergamum... There are competing options for why it might be referred to this way. There's a bunch of choices for us. First of all, there were temples to many false gods with many false ideas all over the city where false sacrifices and sexual immorality were mixed together in a kind of ecstatic, orgy-like practice. That's a candidate for Satan's throne. Second, if you've ever seen the medical symbol with the snake around the staff, you've seen that? You've seen that still really popular in our day? That comes from the Greek god Asclepius, and Pergamum had the biggest temple for this serpent god of healing there. Some some people say maybe the, the serpent imagery, the serpent will heal you, is the idea of this throne of Satan. Third, there was a massive hill with a large throne room dedicated to Zeus, the king of all those gods. And it was in this city. And fourth, this was the first city, and they happily claimed it with pride, that they had built a massive temple to worship the emperor there and likely led the way in the expectation that their citizens would partake in many of these things, particularly the worship of the emperor. So it's impossible to know exactly what Jesus had in mind when he calls it the throne of Satan, but we're not short on ideas. We're not not wondering, like, really, was it that bad? Was it that undone there? Yes, (laughs) just about every way possible. Satan in this place in Pergamum is present and powerful, and it might even appear to the church as they looked around. Think about the landscape I just described. As they look around, it might appear to the church, Satan's reigning. Satan's winning here. Satan's having his way here. Satan's having his day here. I better move out of here if I'm going to get away from Satan because Satan's winning. But maybe more than all the landscape, to put an exclamation mark on it, the different idol and the different emperor worship was prominent enough and expected enough and important enough in this city that to those who did not join in, like Antipas, Martyrdom was an option. So it wasn't just full of false gods. Lots of places were like that. It was against Jesus. Not just full of false gods, but against Jesus. To be the church here meant living in a place called the throne of Satan where you knew, you knew your life was at risk. And this has happened so many times throughout history This is an interesting feature of pluralistic cultures, right? Pluralistic culture says you can sacrifice to whatever God you want, including the emperor for good luck, for prosperity in business, for many other things. Do whatever you want. Just don't say Jesus is the only way. In a culture of plurality, that's okay until it's Jesus exclusively. And then there's growing frustration in vitriol and violence. Well, why? Why would Jesus, who's just supposed to be a God, right, among many gods, why would Jesus make people so angry? There's this little group, probably not much power, probably not much prominence that's worshiping Jesus. Think about it. 
in a world and economy that depended on fear of the gods and the need for temple sacrifice to appease them, Jesus would have wrecked that system. He would have wrecked that system by saying there was salvation through his sacrifice for sins alone. There was a, a God that, that didn't stand on high and demand your sacrifice in order to appease him. There was a God who sent his son into the world, God, man himself, that sacrificed for you to appease the wrath of God. And now you got the opportunity to please him. That would have undone everything, right? We saw that in Acts as people brought their, their gods to the middle and the silversmiths were not happy. Silversmith business was rough in Ephesus when Jesus showed up. In a world where sexual immorality and false gods dominated so much of the trade and allure and appeal of the city, Jesus calling for worship of him alone and to abstain from sexual immorality would have felt, as, would have felt condemning, judgmental, unsettling as a number of followers simply stopped participating. In a world that demanded this worship of false gods to keep peace, right? Why, why worship the emperor? Why call the emperor Lord? Because then everyone's under his thumb, right? He has control. It's a control maintenance tactic. And in a world that demanded that, it would have pricked the conscience when someone otherwise innocent like Antipas reminded the world of another innocent man murdered on a cross who said he would save a people from their sins and now that people is following in his footsteps to death for the sake of his name. The world wouldn't have known what to do with that. And this church in Pergamum is commended because despite the threats of pain and persecution and even in the valley of the shadow of death, they held fast and they stayed faithful to the name of Jesus. Many Christians at this time were turned in by their own families, turned into the authorities by their own friends who feared guilt by association, so tried to get out ahead of it, or by some who really believed they were atheists or heretics. Many Christians, you can read stories about it, lost out on comfort or commerce because they were known for their lack of participation in this system. And yet for them, they admit Jesus. At the Jesus of Revelation 1, Jesus had changed everything and they could not walk away from him. And we live in a place where right now we don't have any Antipas we can point to, a place where there's not martyrdom for our faithfulness to Jesus, but we do live in a place that has many gods of self and sexuality and success all wrapped up together in a strange kind of threefold cord that says it's fine with all of them coexisting unless you claim the name of the one who says to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. And if you do, you could be deemed hateful and intolerant. You could see eye rolls at your workplace. Classmates and coworkers will probably think you're strange. Friends and family might distance themselves. There could be costs. Kids... Following Jesus will never be very popular or normal in the world we live in. It's probably getting less and less popular. But we want to be like Pergamum. <laughs> we want to hear this commendation and, and receive this commendation ourselves. We want to cling to the name of Jesus no matter how much our society sets up these altars to these other places of worship. No matter how strange or foolish we will seem in the coming years. No matter how much it costs. I pray that South City's church would say we've met Jesus he changes everything. We can't walk away. We can't worship where you worship. Point number two, rebuke for faithlessness. Look at verse 12 and then verses 14 to 16. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Then look at verse 16. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. So here is a church receiving a letter and even some recognition for their faithfulness. And yet Jesus tells them he has a two-edged sword. Clearly a warning. He's warning them. Now when we see Jesus like that, we could think, it's a bit much, Jesus. A little harsh, threatening your church with a sword. But this is a 
loving warning. (laughs) He's not using the sword yet. But he's warning them he'll have to if they don't do what? What's the word there? Repent. This is a loving warning. This This is a warning shot. Church, I'm here. I see you. I see what's going on. But there's still time. There's still hope if you'll repent. Turn away from these things or I will, he says, war against them with the sword of my mouth. Some were faithful, some were not. And if those who are not faithful do not repent, he will have to war against them with the sword of his mouth. If they don't turn and repent, those doing foolish things in my church, then I will bring my holy word against them and undo them and war against them. Jesus is a mighty warrior, but you don't want to war against Jesus. You don't want him warring against you. You want Jesus on your side. So what is going on? What's going on that Jesus says he's against them and ready to make war if they don't turn? Well, look at verses 14 to 15. He says, I have a few things against you. You have some there. Who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So we talked through this briefly a couple weeks ago, but Balaam was known as a false teacher and a person who led Israel astray in the Old Testament. Listen to Numbers 25, verses 1 to 3. When Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. So who convinced Israel to do that wicked thing in Numbers 25? Well, here's what it says in Numbers 31, 16. Behold, these... On Balaam's advice, caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And so the plague came among the congregation of the Lord. So Balaam was seen as this false teacher who said false, enticing things to get Israel to commit idolatry and immorality. So much so was this incident known that throughout the New Testament, like in 2 Peter and in Jude, when there are false teachers leading people into false worship, especially sexual immorality, they just say shorthand, it's like Balaam. It's like Balaam. So he was known. So as you read this, it's not some obscure thing. They're like, oh yeah, that's, that's what we always say. It's like Balaam when this kind of thing happens. So the people reading this would have known the story well and probably even knew that for Jesus to use this shorthand meant it was a serious thing they were being accused of. Israel had convinced itself by false teaching that these women were okay to have and then were enticed by their sin further into false worship, leaving the morality and worship of the true God behind for immorality and false worship. So how does this relate to the Nicolaitans? Well, likely, stick with me here, we're going to get through this together. The Nicolaitans were an early heretical group that believed in kind of a strict physical, spiritual divide. Physical over here, spiritual over here. All that was physical was false or bad, and all that was spiritual was real and good, which led to two pretty extreme positions. One position would be stay away from everything physical (laughs) or physically pleasurable, right? So asceticism. Avoidance, abstinence, stay away. Or two, because they're separate, what you do physically doesn't really matter. So go for it. Indulge. Right? Only the spiritual matters anyway, so give yourself to the physical. Right? Indulgence, intoxication, idolatry. And what do you think happened in a place where there was all sorts of intoxication? Indulgence, idolatry, which side of those ideas do you think won out? Like so many times there's some false teaching and there's a culture around it that just says, it's okay. It's okay. And we convince ourselves it's okay because we like our sin. 
It's okay, this, this little step is okay, this little thing is okay. I mean, it's not as bad as they're doing it, or here's this idea I heard somewhere, and it must be okay. Other people are doing it. And therefore, Jesus is likely saying, you're being led to false things. You're being led from various avenues to believe that sexual immorality, even at temple feasts, the syncretistic idolatry and this compromise are no big deal. You're being duped like Balaam duped Israel. And because of the false teaching, you're not even feeling any guilt over it. How is it, church, that in the midst of persecution and martyrdom, you'll hold fast to my name, you'll claim my name, but you don't get that this is wrong. You don't see that this is wrong. How your mind is divided. What is going on, church, is what Jesus is saying here. And then he's saying, but I'm here. I see. I have a sword. Don't want to use it, but I will. In Numbers, 30, in Numbers 25, that sexual immorality and that idolatry led to a plague. Do you remember how that plague was stopped? I'll read it to you, Numbers 25. Here's how brazen and bold Israel had gotten with their sin. Behold, one of the people of Israel came and they brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. So there's some weeping over the sin that's happening and there's others so brazen, they're just like, we're just doing this thing. We're doing this thing, we're just giving into the sin. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman. Thus the plague of the people of Israel was stopped. A sword, a spear, to end the sinful indulgence and idolatry. And again, the people know this story and they hear Jesus say, I have a sword. I'm not messing around here with sin. A sword to pierce through the lies. A sword to shock the people into their senses and back to following the true God. Jesus stands with a sword among the church at Pergamum. Yes, they are being martyred, some with swords, but it is better to suffer the wrath of the dragon and his beastly systems temporarily than the wrath of the lamb eternally. (laughs) It's the point Jesus is making. The lion is actually a slain lamb, praise God, but that lamb is still a roaring lion. (laughs) Both. Kids, the point for you is that Jesus is real. And even though it's hard to understand sometimes how real he is, I remember being a little kid and thinking, what what does it mean that Jesus is real? (laughs) Who is he? Where is he? But he's real. (laughs) And the point is that he's real and and he wants to keep changing us to obey him more. So kids... Even for you today, if there's some area of your life where you know you're sinning, Jesus wants you to obey him and find more life in him. That's what he wants for you kids. He wants that for the four-year-olds in this room and the 94-year-olds in this room. And we see this all over. It's not, it's not hard. I'm not even going to do it because it's not hard. We see in our culture so-called churches that have been duped by immorality and now worship at the altar of false gods of our culture. It's not hard to see it. You can make the connections, right? The Bible's still relevant. And we should be careful. We should be careful not to worship at the altar of self or sexuality ourselves in the age of self-expression and self-indulgence as a church. Yet as we look around at that chaos, we should be comforted that Jesus is real and won't simply give it a pass. But let's let it get a little bit closer to home, right? Because maybe that's like, yeah, those churches out there, oh, the stuff they do. Man, Jesus is probably with a sword there, right? He's probably got a harp here, just playing sweet music to us. I don't think that's how you play a harp. <laughs> doesn't matter. But let's let it get closer to home. What about what you look at on your phone? Or what about the kind of shows you might be willing to let your eyes look at, right? It's not that bad. See a little bit, fast forward it. It's no big deal. It's not going to affect me. What about those relationships? The number of Christian couples that have asked me 
how far is really too far? That's the wrong question. <laughs> what pleases Jesus? Or what honors Jesus? Or what about where we say we follow Jesus, but we have these hidden parts of our lives? Pastor David did a, an illustration with it, right? The outer and the inner. These hidden parts of our lives where we act like sin doesn't matter, where we, we cuddle with our sin, right? We, we have this sin that's like a little lion cub hanging out with us, but it just grows and grows, and we think that this lion's never going to eat us. We have these locked doors that no one knows about, that no one sees. They start out as small. They don't seem big, but it can be as small as apathy. <laughs> just don't care that much about Jesus, don't really want to pursue him that much, don't really want to fight my sin this hard, and that grows. It can be slander and gossip. It can be impatience that grows to explosive anger, lust, or bitterness. Our little altar that we keep in that locked door that no one gets to see. But you can make a, a sure bet of it that once or twice a week you go in there and lock that door and you make your sacrifice, right? You hang out there for a little while and go, Jesus, right, the door is locked. He can't see here. His burning eyes, right? He's not exactly like Superman. He can't like see through everything. And we just trick ourselves. Is Jesus really here? No one's here in this room with me with my phone, and that's in the church, right? It's not just out there. That's in here. And Jesus is among the lampstands for our good in encouragement and exhortation to love by warning. Jesus must change everything because Jesus is real and he's here. If you get nothing else from Revelation, I hope you get the sense that Jesus is real and he's here. <laughs> he's just Always real, and he's always here. And he's calling these people to repent. And if not, for those faithful people in the church to cast them out, likely through church discipline, to not let the whole place face the wrath of the sword. Jesus is saying it does no good to name the name of Jesus and endure persecution while winking the eye at certain loved, culturally tolerated, and common sin. Jesus is real. And he's here and he's loving enough to give them a warning for the sake of calling them and calling us back this morning from wherever you are. So if you're hearing this this morning and this sounds harsh or hard, this is Jesus saying, I love you. I love you. Come back. Come back. And finally, point number three, reward for faithfulness. Look at verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So again, the call to hear. Jesus is speaking right now. The, the Spirit is speaking to us, calling us to conquer, to run from the temptations of apathy or participation in immorality and idolatry and sin, and to endure tribulation for the sake of the kingdom because Jesus is our treasure. And notice the promises here. Hidden manna and a white stone. So what in the world is going on there? Well, the hidden manna, I think, is pretty easy to understand. If you've been in church for a minute, you know the story of manna. We go to the Old Testament for this picture. What is the food that God gave his people as they wandered in the wilderness waiting for the promised land? Manna. And Jesus is saying, as you wait to get home with me, as you wait to get all the way home to this promised land, this new heavens and new earth, while you wait and while you're not participating and while you feel, while you feel like you're missing out on feasts, I'm going to satisfy you. I'm going to satisfy you. Rather than finding temporary satisfaction and giving into the culture around you, eating food, sacrifice to idols, finding satisfaction in sexual pleasure, I will give you deeper satisfaction of myself. It's hidden because the world can't see it. But Jesus is there, <laughs> satisfying, giving us himself. I am the bread from heaven, right, John 6, and I will satisfy you now and forever with fellowship in me. In other words, Jesus would say the world will tell you you're missing out and that you should just give in to that instant gratification 
gossip and sexual immorality and slander and apathy and impatience and anger. But you'll have deeper, (laughs) sustaining satisfaction as I draw near and pursue you with daily mercy like daily manna to meet all of your needs for life and for your soul. If you lose out on business, I will provide. If you lose out on pleasure, I will be better. If you're alienated and lose out on family and friends, I will give you a new family and I will be your friend. That's what Jesus is saying to these churches. And what of this white stone? This one people go a few different ways on, but the more I read, the more I think it's likely a stone of innocence or acquittal. One of the most common things um, in court settings at this time was that when a judge or a juror handed out a verdict, they would do it with stones. So you think of in our courtroom, right, there's the paper, the judge sees it, and then they, they read out the verdict. Here, what would have happened is you were on trial for something, what the judge or jury would have done is give you a stone. Black meant guilty, and white meant innocent. So this white stone would indicate that though the world has indicted and even punished, and even killed some, Jesus is the ultimate judge, and he has declared them innocent, blameless, washed white as snow. They're acquitted by the judge that matters. And what about this hidden name? Are you going to get to the new heavens and new earth, and you're going to have some goofy name (laughs) that no one else knows, right? They're still going to call you Dave, but you know what your name is, right? But no one else knows, right? I don't think that's what's going on here. Here's, let me read some other passages about names in Revelation. Revelation 3.12, just a little bit beyond where we're at. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven of my own new name. Or Revelation 19, 12 and 16. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. Verse 16. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Or 22, 4. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. What's this hidden name on this stone of acquittal, right? You're, you're, I'm going to satisfy you with manna. I'm going to acquit you and call you innocent. And on the stone that says you're innocent, you're going to have a new name no one knows. And like the hidden manna, you know what that name is? Jesus. I belong to Jesus. King of kings. Lord of lords. Right, I belong to that heavenly city. That's who I am. So what's going on? He's saying, though the world will say you're guilty and punish you, I, the King of kings and Lord of lords, say you're innocent, and I'm going to put my name on you to prove it. You're a part of my family. I've redeemed you and freed you from your sins by my blood. You've been saved by me. You've clung to my name. You've run away from sin imperfectly, but really from immorality and idolatry. And you've done all this because I've given you my name. What an amazing thing to receive the name of Jesus. This is who you are, church, most at heart. This is where your satisfaction comes. This is where your identity comes from. This is where you go when you're tempted and trials come. You say, I know who I am. I belong to Jesus. He's declared me innocent. I have his name on me. He's going to satisfy me day by day by day with his mercies now and forever. Again, the question for the church in Pergamum and the question for the church in Lakeville, Minnesota, is will we give in now and receive the praise, satisfaction, and pleasure of dragon-fueled beastly realities temporarily and the wrath of the Lamb eternally? Or will we receive the wrath of the dragon and beastly systems temporarily now and the satisfaction, joy, and name of Jesus eternally? That's the question. (laughs) I said last week the math is simple. Math is simple. Eternity is longer than not eternity. Will we choose the sword or the stone? Jesus is here. Jesus is real. He's calling to us out of love. Lay lay down immorality. Lay down idolatry. Lay down sin. And come back to me. 
Let's pray. So Lord, you are here now. And you know, you know every heart in this place. You know, Lord, the places where your people need to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You've clung to my name. You've followed me in obedience. You're walking with me faithfully. Lord, I pray in this moment that you would speak those kinds of encouraging words to the hearts of your people. And Lord, you know where your people, including me, where all of us are struggling with some sin. Where we've made false little altars that we think no one else can see, that we maybe even think you can't see, or maybe you don't take it that seriously. We can get away with it for a while. And Lord, you know where we need to hear, I'm here and I have a sword. Repent. Turn back. Come walk with me again. Lord, help us hear it as a real, loving warning. Meant to orient your church on your goodness and your beauty and your truth again and help us walk in new humility, courage, and repentance. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to do this in such a way that the the world would see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. So we want, Lord, not not to us, not to us, Lord, but to your name be the glory. That by the way that we treasure and trust and follow and submit to your good word, Lord, that we would be showing that you're as good and beautiful and sweet and pleasurable and awesome and worthy as you say you are. So, Lord, now as we get to come and eat and drink with Jesus, Lord, be with your people. Help us lay down our sins. Help us find comfort that you've given us your name. Help us find comfort that you'll feed us. Satisfy us with better things than the world has to offer. Now come now and help us repent and reorient, Lord, and reconcile where we need to. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.